Welcome to the session and thank you for joining. What we're going to be talking about for the next 25 or so minutes is, first of all, whether we consider airflow as an industry standard already, and if not, what do we think it takes for it to get there? So that's basically the idea we would like to discuss with you, and obviously we're looking forward to some interaction and uh, feedback from you as well during the session. My name is Philip Knapik. I'm a group product manager responsible for Cloud Composer. I've been working with Airflow for the last five years or so. Before that, I was actually working on some other uh, workflow orchestration product within Google Cloud ecosystem called uh, Google Workflow. So orchestration is very uh, close to my heart in a way. Passing over to Rafa, my colleague. Okay, so my name is Rafa Begat. I have been working with uh, Airflow for the last uh, five years. Uh, I'm part of the Airflow a summit organizing uh, uh, team, and uh, of course, I'm also working on Cloud Composer, which is a managed version for Airflow that we offer on Google Cloud. Uh, this talk is not related to, to Cloud Composer, it's a very Airflow focused one. Uh, if you have any questions related to this talk or any other aspects related to Airflow, whatever you, you, is interesting for you running some of the workloads uh, using Airflow, you can reach us in, in the book. And maybe like boiler uh, or executive summary for this talk, uh, Airflow is actually on, uh, or, or at least we believe, is on the path to become de facto the standard for orchestration in the industry. Um, of course, uh, again, probably you heard it many times, Airflow 3 uh, it actually accelerates, uh, in, my, in our opinion, making Airflow really de facto industry st standard. There might be some parts that might be missing, so let's discuss uh, during the, this talk uh, how far we are from uh, being uh, a de facto standard for orchestration. So maybe let's first start with the history of, of Airflow because this is actually important part of the of becoming the standard. So first, Airflow was born in 2014, then it was open sourced a year later in 2015. In 2016, Airflow is, becomes an incubated project as part of the Apache Software Foundation. And in 2018, it is promoted to the top level project of Apache Software Foundation. Community grows, number of, co of contributors uh, also uh, grows. Uh, we have commercial services offered for Airflow, which is actually big, uh, big, uh, strong signal that uh, other companies actually really believe in Airflow. They want to offer services uh, so uh, other users, uh, so users of Airflow actually can use these services. Uh, maybe they are not interested in all the nitty gritty details of Airflow, but definitely they would like to use the technology. On the other hand, those companies also probably are betting on the, from the business perspective, uh, that Airflow is actually a technology that you can make uh, money. So it's it's very strong signal that technology is actually very, very promising. We have Airflow Airflow Summit. So th this year, this is the fifth edition of the Airflow uh, Global uh, con con Conference. Everything started in 2022. We have a lot of Airflow meetups, uh, and those meetups are actually happening and taking place uh, all over the world, li literally uh, in many, many uh, countries. We have uh, Airflow One. Airflow 2, and now we started working on Airflow 3. So, so definitely you can see the progress in the uh, in the technology. There are new generations of uh, of technology are are being produced. Uh, we see a huge adoption of Airflow, and uh, what is very important, we see the adoption of Airflow within uh, enterprise companies. Uh, companies uh, that are doing uh, delivering banking services, companies from the telecommunication industry, uh, a lot of companies from S&P uh, 500 are using, using Airflow. It's also a very strong signal that the, those companies actually basically are trusting the, the technology and uh, they are injecting Airflow into their critical process. We have also a lot of competing uh, technologies uh, being created. Probably those technologies believe that they want to address something that is maybe missing or not performed by Airflow like at the best possible way. So those technologies are being created. And what is interesting, very, very frequently, those technologies are the either directly or indirectly compare themselves to Airflow. So as if Airflow is, is something uh, like a blue, blueprint for orchestration. It's very important signal. Uh, Still, even though there are so many orchestration technologies, Airflow is very strong. Uh, and it's basically no fact that uh, currently it is the 
most popular uh, orchestration technology all over the, the, the world, despite all the other technologies being uh, created. Uh, what, what is more, you can see that airflow is actually a skill, universal skill, uh, and this is a skill that is wanted by, by employers. Uh, so it's very frequently used by data engineers, uh, data scientists, uh, and many other types of uh, engineers. And you acquire those skills and you change companies, but those skills uh, stay, stay with, uh, with you. Uh, there are online trainings for Airflow. There are books being written about Airflow. There is Slack channel, there is Stack Overflow, there are monthly town halls. Uh, so there are a lot of things happening around Airflow, uh, as if there is like an ecosystem of events and processes built around the, the technology. So we could ask actually ourselves a question, is uh, Airflow already a standard? Or maybe if it is not yet, what, what kind of things uh, might, be, might be missing? And together with Philippe, we will try to approach answering this question in, from two angles. Uh, first of all, we will try to take a look at uh, other technologies that are considered industry st standards. Um, here we will be using uh, an examples of Kubernetes and uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Philip is going to list all the features uh, of, uh, an, of an industry standard, and we will try to take a look which uh, features of this standard, uh, industry standard definition are already met by Airflow and what requires some additional work. But wait a second, why we uh, even uh, talk about uh, um, becoming a standard? Why, uh, a technology, why it is important for a technology to be a standard in the industry? Uh, and there are a lot of reasons. I think that the most important uh, thing is actually uh, talent acquisition. Uh, if something is, is a standard, there are more and more people uh, joining the community and they are developing the, the, the technology because they believe in this technology. There are more and more contributions uh, developing the, the technology. And um, uh, the technology is being modernized because what was implemented like four years ago might not be proper to respond to nowadays uh, challenges and more importantly, the, the challenges of, of the future. So this the talented engineers who are working on the technology are really important because these are the, the people who will be pushing the technology uh, further and developing it. Uh, once we have the new features, there will be innovation, there will be new uh, application uh, the, of the technology to new use cases, uh, and so on like that. We could actually talk more why the standard, why becoming a standard is important, but we can, we can actually stop at, at this point. Let's take a look at Kubernetes. Definitely it is an industry standard for uh, container orchestration. You hardly even uh, hear nowadays about other orchestration systems uh, because Kubernetes is so good that basically dominated the, the, the whole area. Uh, and let's take a look why, or let's talk about, uh, about it, why it happened like this. So uh, first of all, Kubernetes is governed by TNCF organization which is kind of a similar organization to Apache Software Foundation. Within this organization, there is a steering committee that is overseeing the direction of uh, Kubernetes development. There are special interest, interest groups that are responsible for feature development. The steering committee helps to uh, triage the, all, the, all the processes, sometimes simplifies, simplifies decision making. There is a very strict control when it comes to reviewing the designs and intro introducing the changes. Around Kubernetes, there is a very rich ecosystem of technologies. And what's more, uh, Kubernetes is, platform, is a platform for building other systems. So instead of inventing yet another orchestrator, people are using Kubernetes and they are building based, uh, built on top of Kubernetes. There are, of course, commercial offerings uh, for Kubernetes. So there are companies who, are, who really strongly believe in, uh, in business value of the technology. Of course, there are a lot of conferences, books, certifications, and uh, this technology is very scalable, portable. Uh, you can have a Kubernetes on uh, AWS Cloud, on Google Cloud, or in your on-prem uh, data center. It will be the same uh, technology. Similarly to Postgres, we don't need to 
dive into all the details related to progress, to progress, but it's also uh, established in industry, uh, industry standard. There are a lot of extensive extensions and plugins to, to Postgres, but the core functionality of Postgres stays the same, and people can fully rely on it. And actually, when you take into account the popularity of, our, of other database technologies, you can see actually that Postgres is gaining a lot due to the fact that it is a standard. So if you take a look at other database technologies, they are, their popularity is pretty stable, but in case of Postgres SQL, the, the popularity really, really grows. Okay, so now we're trying to figure out whether Airflow is already there, whether Airflow is a standard and what it takes. So again, as Rafael said, to assess that, we can't really look into it like we feel like it is or we feel like it isn't. We have to break down the definition of what becomes, what makes a technology a standard into some accessible element. And so, again, we asked Gemini to see what features does a technology need to have to be considered a uh, standard in the industry. So let me go through those one by one. First of all, obviously widespread adoption, right? If a technology is used uh, across the board in the industry in various use cases, various companies, various you know, solutions being used outside of different domains, then that's exactly what is needed for a technology to become a standard because you need to have this broad talent pool to be able to contribute to it. Openness and interoperability, right? So the technology cannot be a closed one. And obviously any open source technology gets a very good score from that perspective, open by default, typically extensible as well. So, but that's a very important element for technology. And so for example, if we think about Postgres and Kubernetes, they absolutely are both open and interoperable. Backwards compatibility. Actually with this one, I lied a little bit because Gemini actually said stability. But the word stability in here meant not really reliability from an operational perspective. It meant stability from a definition perspective, stability from, let's say, an API perspective. If I implement something based on a technology that is supposed to be a standard, I shouldn't be worried about it working differently the day after or in the next minor release, right? Because then it's becoming troublesome and obviously the adoption will not be as wide as it could be. So backwards compatibility is essential for a technology to be a standard. Community support and ecosystem, actually the next two uh, dimensions are human related, I would argue. So we need to have a broad community of supporters, of contributors. Ecosystem is also around tooling. Is there a tooling around, for example, Postgres? Like, can I plug some tools to manage performance or change some things in Postgres, for example? Absolutely, yes. And they are there because it is a standard as well. And those tools also help it to become a standard. Vendor support and backing. Not always, even with great documentation, which is actually the next point you would like to be doing those things yourself. Sometimes you may want to delegate the work to somebody else. And if you do, there should be a group of people, companies, organizations, partners, you can delegate this work to, right? So that's definitely important for you to be able to use the technology as a standard. Moving on, address a critical need. If a need is very narrow and niche, obviously it automatically reduces the possibility for a technology to become a standard simply because the impact of the technology is just not as great as it could be, right? So it aut automatically limits how many people would like to contribute and use it on a daily basis. Scalability and performance. This is very important. So imagine an architect needs to make a decision whether to use technology A or B. Obviously architects and people who are responsible for administration of IT systems would want to rely on something that they don't have to worry about too much, right? Like once you deploy, it's going to be scalable, it will perform, you don't have to be tweaking it on a daily basis. So Scalability and performance is essential in decisions being made by CTOs, architects, and, and administrators when picking a technology as an underlying component of their stack. This one I probably don't even have to explain security and compliance. Uh, I mean, it's essential, right? Any layer of your stack, whatever this technology is, needs to be secure and needs to follow compliance rules. Last but not least is cost effectiveness. This is somewhat a side effect uh, of some other ingredients we have in here, like for example, if it's scalable and performant and, and things of that nature, and you have access to vendors, for instance, then it, the likelihood of it being cost effective is actually quite high. But overall, these are the dimensions that Gemini would call out as uh, ingredients that uh, a technology needs to follow, needs to have, for it to become an industry standard. I actually completely agree with this list. And in a second, we're going to look into Airflow with our subjective perspective here on whether Airflow, we believe, meets this criteria or not, and what it takes. Actually, before I go there, let me very quickly just come to the list of also architectural and technical aspects of Airflow's design that are quite helpful in it becoming uh, an industry standard. So 
many architectural decisions being made over the years, consciously or not, uh, were done in the direction of it to become actually a, a very good tool from this perspective. So let me just very quickly scan through it. So the fact that it's modular, uh, it has modular architecture. You can use various executors. It can run on different compute layers. It can use different databases. It can even delegate some of the airflow backend capabilities to various backends, like data lineage, XCOM, what else do we have here? SQLs, for instance, right? So all of those things can rely on various technologies underneath. It is this interoperability that I mentioned. It's this openness that I mentioned as well. Obviously, it translates into the usage, the, the explosion of provider packages. We have all those integrations in operators we have is a testimony of this openness and the size of the ecosystem and contribution of the community. We have stable REST API and CLI interfaces, which definitely contribute to this backward compatibility dimension as mentioned earlier, and obviously the community, the documentation, accessibility to experts, this is absolutely there as well. So that is great. Now let's look into those dimensions one by one. Widespread adoption, I don't think we need to convince much anyone about it. On our side, we have thousands of customers using Airflow within Cloud Composer. But, you know, there's definitely a, a big variety of use cases, industries, customers using it. So I don't think anybody would challenge that. That it's open and interoperable, uh, I think it's also quite clear. Obviously, it's open source. All the uh, provider packages created all those uh, pluggable backends that we're talking about. Uh, this is a great proof of its uh, being, you know, uh, almost a role model of openness and interoperability. As you can see, I've consciously skipped something. So there are some items to discuss in a moment. But moving on to another thing that I consider a strength, community support and ecosystem. You know, the fact that we have such events with hundreds of participants, tons of people online, I think, you know, it's something that doesn't require further explanation. Maybe with ecosystem, we can discuss a little bit. Could there be better tooling for some elements, right? But overall, I think it's still a strength. Vendor support and backing, even in this event, we have, if I'm counting right, at least four providers of Airflow services as a managed service. We have many partners, many individual experts that can help. So I don't think there is any challenge with vendor support and backing. Clarity of documentation, obviously, that's a subjective thing. From my perspective, I think it's, it's pretty good uh, for the most part. You know, we can read and learn about Airflow in various ways, also from events like this one. This also contributes to the documentation with all the recordings we're creating here. The fact that uh, it addresses a critical need is also very clear. We, from, for instance, from our side, we have uh, customers representing practically all of the dimensions, all of the industries, and they use it on a daily basis in various places, but it definitely is critical. Let's then talk about things where some work could be done to get even further to becoming a standard. By the way, many of this work, again, spoiler alert, is already lined up in Airflow 3, which we're going to show in a second. I'll drill down to those in a second. Backwards compatibility, scalability and performance, security and compliance, and cost effectiveness. So let's talk about those four. Backwards compatibility. So coming back to the example of Kubernetes and Postgres, for example, both of those technologies, you can enable to go with automated minor version upgrades without uh, losing sleep over it, right? So it will work and 99 point something percent of the time it's going to just work fine. The upgrade will continue and you're good. At least our perspective and our experience is that with Airflow that not necessarily wouldn't work even within minor versions, right? So there's definitely something, obviously part of it is, you know, related to the fact that we're part of the Python ecosystem. There are, you know, libraries and all those other things. So it's not just Air Airflow itself, but it definitely is something to consider as a challenge when it comes to ability to keep it up in, you know, up to date. There are some things that are absolutely positive in here. For example, REST API and CLI stability is, you know, at a very good level. Some elements to call out, like we've made as a community some choices around DAG definitions that are no longer there and whoever created DAGs based on those capabilities, like smart sensors, for example, and there are some changes in timetables and a few other things. This could be broken with some of the upgrades. Uh, obviously, provider packages backward incompatibilities is, is another dimension, right? By, you know, upgrading to a newer version, you can break some things. And there's also Airflow configuration stability, right? Over, even within Airflow 2 itself, we have created many new configuration uh, settings and deprecated some others. So when you upgrade, you may actually uh, lose some of the settings you had, and for example, your performance may struggle. Speaking of performance, you know, as a side comment, we've seen customers, or I've seen customers moving over to Cloud Composer from self-managed Airflow, having 96 core databases to run two or 3,000 tasks, right? I mean, it works. But is it as efficient as it could be? Probably not, right? So these are examples of things that could be slightly improved. 
for larger scale implementations. Another thing I would call out from performance perspective is the continuous parsing of Python DAC files, which again, if thousands of files are there in your storage, could be quite expensive and somewhat inefficient, right? On the flip side, on the good side, we have DAC parsing and scheduling separation introduced not that long ago. We're actually using it in the latest version of Composer. This is a tremendous improvement of performance that we're observing. But again, some other things, especially around handling task instances at large is something that could be improved. Security and compliance, very short. Role-based access controls is something all customers would like to be using, and they do from what we're seeing in web server. But the fact that it doesn't reach to all of the layers of APIs is concerning. The fact that you can use CLI bypassing it, the fact that you can directly access database and essentially overwrite whatever settings you have, and therefore bypass RBAC is also concerning for customers. Obviously, the same applies to role-based access controls for secrets, connections, variables, and those other things. So we basically need to expand the role-based access controls capability to all the other layers. Access to those sensitive components, block direct access to the database, and also expand it to CLI. Cost effectiveness is somewhat a, a byproduct of those other elements, especially the, the, the performance and scalability that I mentioned, right? So for example, uh, the fact that we have continuous parsing of DAX means that in many cases you need to have you know 16 or 20 cores doing it continuously just to cater for all of the Python files you have, right? That's, that's already a cost that is there. And maybe if there was an event-based DAG parsing, for instance, where it wouldn't be done on a continuous basis, for some use cases could work just fine, while the cost would be dramatically reduced. Again, the same point about light handling of task instances. What we mean by this is that if there's a long-running task, and let's say it's not deferrable, uh, the amount of interactions that this task has, for example, with a database is tremendous, right? And if you then multiply it by thousands of tasks that are running concurrently, you end up with those 96 core databases quite fast, right? And this is where if we had a different mechanism for handling task instances without such a load on databases and other components, the, the scalability of Airflow would be dramatically, dramatically improved, which translates not only into performance, but also into uh, cost effectiveness. Now, trying to put it all together, there seems to be some themes that we can call out in here. First of all, everything that we, we talked about when it comes to backward incompatible changes is actually not really a technical capability. This is more about the work process. So the change management process that we have, you know, if it's strong enough to look for those cases of backward incompatibilities and tries to catch those cases early on and tries to, uh, let's say, justify every single case of backward incompatibility, then the likelihood of backward incompatible changes could be diminished, could be, could be reduced, right? So that's something that would be, and we continuously advocate for, to be very, very careful uh, with all the backward incompatible changes. And I would say even more, uh, we're even more sensitive to changes in DAG files or, or, or Python providers, even more so than, for example, environment configurations. Because imagine you have hundreds of environments with tens of thousands of DAGs, and that's really the scale some customers end up with. And now something is backwards incompatible. Imagine changing all this, right? This is tremendous amount of work that organizations sometimes need to have. So we have to be really, really clear about it. So again, we're just kind of mildly advocating for being very, very careful about change management process. And it, this also applies to uh, providers of provider packages, right? So that's, that's basically also, it also applies there. Scalability, there are some improvements already. Actually, the other theme that is coming from this picture is that you see AIP numbers in here. What we mean by this is that many of the things that we believe Airflow needs to have to become a standard are already lined up, are already part of Airflow free. And obviously we will also be advocating for to make sure that they stay there because it's in everybody's benefit for it to become a standard. And many of those items are already taking place. So I think overall the message is positive, at least from our perspective, that you know, yes, it is close to being a standard. It is not there yet. And things that it's missing to really become an industry standard are either process related, which we as a community have control over, or are mostly already lined up in the upcoming Airflow free version, right? So if we do all this, we believe that the path of, you know, further expansion and usage of Airflow is going to be very, very green and positive. We just need to deliver all those items, right? So with that, let me close and see because we're out of time. 